Hi, agents and listeners, and welcome back to the Age of Independence podcast. I'm Caitlin Agar, your host, and today is a, a little bit of a different episode than what we've done in the past. And Age of Independence is all about taking hold of this new wave of opportunity that's available to you and your agency and evolving your agency from the inside out. And so far, we've heard from some really great leaders within the insurance industry. And today we have two amazing leaders that I'm going to introduce to you guys in, in just a moment. But today's episode is about stepping outside of that insurance box a little bit and um, talking about what we've learned from people that are completely outside of the insurance industry and what we can take from, from their success and their message and bringing it into what we do on an everyday basis with our teams and with our clients. And today's episode is all about a, a special tribute to Tony Shea, the former CEO of Zappos, who unfortunately passed away over the Thanksgiving holiday. And he was so young, it really took all of us by surprise and a lot of shock. And um, so we want to talk about him and honor his legacy today because we've learned so much from the things that he did to build Zappos and what a, what a risk taker he was and what a, a special leader. So I want to um, welcome our guests and introduce them and, and then we'll just talk a little bit about what we've learned from Tony and uh, spend some time reflecting on that. So hi, gentlemen. How are you guys today? Awesome. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. We have Jeff Shi, the CVO at Quantum Assurance International, and we have Zach Gold, the co-founder of GNN Insurance. And I'm just really excited to interview both of you guys today while we talk about Tony, because you're both amazing leaders and have built some pretty crazy cool organizations that are similar in a lot of ways and different in a lot of ways. So thanks for being here. And I'd love for you to just um, share a little bit about yourselves for listeners who might be hearing from you guys for the first time. Um, Zach, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and Gina? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, before we even get started, I, I love the intro that you just started. And it's so funny to think about we're talking about Tony, who's outside the box, but his company specialized on putting things in boxes and shipping them to you. It's just very, <laughs> the, 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 the irony Ironic. Is, <laughs> the irony is right there. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I, co I co-founded GNN Insurance. We opened in 2010 from scratch. Uh, Matt and I both spent a couple years at Liberty Mutual, opened from scratch. Mm -hmm. And we ran the company for 10 years and recently exited the company um, and sold it to um, a, a, another insurance agency. And now we run the agency. So we actually, a little bit, not on, not, not on purpose, have like mimicked Zappos in a different way in that when we launched, we actually referenced Zappos. And when we exited, if you look at my Facebook post, we referenced Zappos. Oddly enough, and we actually stayed in business just about the same amount of time independently. Wow. It's just a very, very strange, not on purpose. I, uh, but it's the Some correlation. Parallel paths there. Yeah, it doesn't cease to amaze me. But um, yeah, that that's a brief intro. Jeff, keep going. What about you? Well, I think what connected us together was your Facebook post. Um, Sunday came around, and I was still shocked about the news because. So many of my friends knew I was such a huge fan of Tony and Tony's book. Like a lot of agents uh, from my captive uh, career came to me because I have built different models of scaling, right? Scaling from a little mom and pop to a small team, small team to an enterprise. And every step of the way, I look for inspirations to help me scale and people I model inside the industry and outside the industry. I told everybody who want to be successful at you know, all say agency or insurance agencies to read Delivering Happiness. So when the passing of Tony Sai happened, everybody was texting me, Facebook messaging me, and I saw your post. Your post was like word for word, exactly what was on my heart. It was just like so different. We lost Kobe already this year, and Kobe was like a big idol for me in life about how oh, yeah. his work ethic is. But Tony was an idol for me in leadership. Like, Kobe was a lone wolf, killer, assassin, idol, right? Tony was, if I want to build an army and I want someone to lead that army, Tony was a lion. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it just sucked, especially he was so young and he just built his new venture capitalist, Venture Frogs. 
And now he get to make other people's dream come true, right? Before he'd done it twice. Links Exchange and Zappos was making his own dream come true. Sold it to Microsoft, sold it to Amazon, the highest level. And, and he would just about to be the one making that decision to help others succeed between him and Alfred. Alfred, for those of you who don't know, he mentioned it in his book. He mentioned it in his uh, TED Talk. Alfred is the CEO of Zappos and also Alfred was the guy that was buying all the pizza from Tony's pizza shop and taking it upstairs to the student dorm and selling for $3, $5, $10 slice to whoever <laughs> drunk college kids. And then he was you know, buying them at 10X retail model. And then Tony was like, I got to bring this guy into my organization. And later on, they built a couple hundred million and billion dollar organization together mm. with zero skill set, but learning and trusting each other. Mm. So- it's so inspiring no. that he built that yeah. off of a philosophy of delivering happiness. It wasn't a, a wolf of Wall Street kind of feel. It was about trying to do something meaningful that was bigger than than just the business. Mm. Yeah, I think it, it is quite interesting. And I find it incredibly interesting because it, it's applicable. Maybe you don't want to be a billion dollar industry. That's a, that's a different, that's not what I'm getting at. But what's applicable is that they didn't start anything with the word the billion they didn't start anything with like this huge desire to revolutionize the shoe industry they didn't even start with the <laughs> idea to deliver happiness to their employees that wasn't the goal they came about that and that came over time and I think a lot of entrepreneurs who get started they put this immense amount of pressure on themselves to have a lot figured out early and what mm -hmm. you can learn from Tony's story is that he had some things figured out but customer service was not what they were trying to deliver early on. They didn't know what they were doing too much early on. They were buying shoes from like a foot locker by taking a picture of it and then shipping it for the exact same price just to see if the model worked. Wow. You know, it wasn't a huge thing. And then they slowly and slowly and slowly evolved. But one of the big takeaways that I took from Tony's early story uh, when they were first building Zappos is to never outsource your core competency. I think that is just such sound advice. And as entrepreneurs, one of the key things we try to do is delegate. That's one of the things we try to delegate and then elevate ourselves and delegate and elevate. And occasionally pointing the finger at myself, I've delegated my core competency a couple of times and it's bit me every time, every time. Um, and he has such a unique way of saying like, no, 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 we're not actually going to service at take our service model and send it to the Philippines or send it to Mexico or send it to anywhere because that's our core competency. And I think that was just genius. One of his think, very early geniuses. I think it's yeah. because the core competency within your organization carries a heartbeat to it and it has to grow organically through the team being together and through you being there to provide the leadership direction and it, the the people that bring that mission to life every day and so then when you outsource it in the sake of delegating or automation or trying to be a little bit more efficient you lose that heartbeat because it's really hard to replicate on the other side of that fence yeah you know I just want to congratulate you, Zach. We just had our first mic drop moment of the show already. Thank you. That was awesome. That was like, I mean, for people who don't understand, like that was that was on the dot. I have it in my notes. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff, but, guys. But, but Jeff, I mean, you know, as you as you go about, you know, your your career and what you do and how you do it, you have those moments where you have a beer or a coffee with someone you trust or a group of people you trust in your organization. And you didn't set up that beer to say, give me your ideas because that's intimidating to other people. You set up a beer or a coffee just to say, let's just, let's break bread. Let's chat and what have you. Mm -hmm. Tony did that so regularly. And that's just such a great message for entrepreneurs to, to put the jacket and suit down and just to and just to grab a coffee and grab a beer and meet eye to eye with your team and you know time and time again in delivering happiness he referenced those meetings about the ideas he got from that and i think that's just brilliant um it's just brilliant and you can't fake that you know and he did right. it um, so i have a confession i cheated before we started this episode I um I I love YouTube, right? So I have YouTube playing in the background <laughs> while I work every single day. I subscribe to like hundreds of different channels, whether it's about you know 
self-challenging, whether it's about sports, whether it's about the team I follow. And, you know, YouTube allows you to focus on specific topics if you hashtag it, right? So TED Talk mm -hmm. is one of the things that I follow. And I listened to Tony's TED Talk again the day after he uh, passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the biggest challenge in being a CEO in leadership role is three things, right? Cash flow and cash reserve, mm -hmm. people, and also leads, sales, and marketing. Mm -hmm. But if people was one of the three toughest, toughest, toughest challenge for us, Tony talked about in his TED talk about how he interviewed. One of the main question he interviewed, which is something I put in my three main question in an interview, would I go have lunch with you? Would I trust you babysit my daughter or my son? Mm. Would I go grab a drink with you? These are one of the, those three are kind of in the same box, but it's one of the three things. The first two things are generalization, red flags, right? Red flags, are you capable of potential and higher ceilings? Number three, do we connect, do we vibe, right? So if my culture is a bunch of young wolf Wall Street and you are a person from compliance, you're not gonna vibe with my culture. Vice versa, if my culture is a bunch of Susie's and Joanne's that are great, great at being loved and loving on others, and you're just a shark from Grand Cardone, you're not gonna vibe, right? So Tony does an amazing job when he does interviews to make sure that whoever he's interviewing fitting their culture. And then he said that everyone wanna separate work and life. They says, nope, we're not gonna be friends on Facebook. We're not gonna be friends on LinkedIn. We're not gonna be friends on Snap or Instagram because you work for me. You are my employee, I'm your employer. Separation, right? But in reality, we're living the world that connects, right? We're spending nine and a half hours with each other, eight and a half hour work days and one hour if we're having lunch together. So Tony is the opposite of that. He was such a visionary. He talked about this 10 years ago that he believed Zappo is the first integration of work and life. Mm. And that's what made him so successful. And he said that how you treat your employees, how they can treat your customers. Mm. And that was 10 years ago. Mm. It's just so well said, I, I agree. And he, uh, on that, like, because he doubled down on people, and that's another mm -hmm. way to say your culture, right? It's the same thing. And because he doubled down on your culture, he was like, if you get the best people who fit your culture, they're just going to get the work done that creates the wow experiences and the customer service and the sales and whatever. And it just shortens the training cycle. You know, you really don't have to. And so what he did, something I, co I, I copied a lot of things, but one of the things I copied from him in his book was he talked about how the first couple interviews are with HR. And then after they get past HR, then they actually meet with you know myself or whomever uh, or other people from the team more importantly and just kind of that meeting is nothing about like where are you from so let me look at your resume it's all about what you just talked about jeff about like you know does this person swear because if we swear here they better be okay with that you know like little tiny like that kind of culture yep. like you know do, will they fit are they gonna like throw a red flag because we were sweatpants in the office or something like they like literally he goes through that kind of stuff. And I, I just, I love that. It's so smart. Um, so smart. It's a hundred percent. Like I, I hear, so I'm recruiting recruiters, right? I'm recruiting people who recruit agents to join quantum, to become quantum agent. And I talk to these recruiters and then they tell me, oh yeah, my agent loved me. Right. And then I keep on having a conversation with them. And then I said, oh, okay. So, I said, give me some names, right? Because I know a lot of agents. And then they're like, oh, this agent, this agent, this agent, this agent. So I looked them up on Facebook. I looked them up on LinkedIn. But they're not even friends with their agents. So how can you say they love me when you're not participating in their life? Mm -mm, you can't. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many other people who talk about work-life balance, right? I am, it's, it's, it's a mythical term. It's a unicorn. Uh, in, in essence, I mean, if you have work-life balance, it means one stop and one begins. It, it's not accurate. Um, and, yep. you know, Zappos talked a lot about that when, when Tony moved the company to Vegas in that big, huge moment. And one of the things I wrote down in my notes app when I read that book way back then, or not notes app when I wrote my journal way back then, was I wrote down like, would, um, would our team at GNN move to Vegas if I moved them? And I had like a hard thing. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. 
And I just think that that really kind of set in my mind in motion about like, how do you create such a strong culture that if you move to Vegas, a good amount of the team would be like, I'm down, I'm down. Because you know what? I can make other friends in Vegas for sure, but these are my friends that were going with you. And that's where the work-life balance, I think, intersects. Man, their tax bracket would have dramatically changed too. <laughs> Massachusetts and Nevada has a big difference. Yeah. Zach's yeah. joining us from the Boston area today. And, um, and Jeff is in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. So neither of those are the two most affordable places in the country. To live. <laughs> Yeah. at least not compared to where where i am in north dallas so um, i think that's a great barometer for gauging if you have created the culture that you're you're looking for is asking you know would do i think my team would be actually willing to relocate i think that's something interesting to write down and it it makes me think of some other things that tony did to gauge team culture. And one of those things was his practice that they call the offer. Um, so to give you guys just a little snapshot of that, apparently, and you fact check me guys, um, Tony started a program at Zappos where he only wanted people that were dedicated and all in and totally engaged to continue with the company. So they bring somebody on board, they train them, educate them, give them, I think about 90 days to begin like immersing in Zappos culture and becoming part of a team. And at the end of that period of time, they were extended something called the offer. And the offer was an opportunity to take a hefty bonus to leave the company. Two month pay. Two months pay. And that to me is just, when I hear that, to me, that's just kind of like a, a speechless moment where I'm just like, wow, that, that says a lot. And um, it's something I haven't, I haven't had the courage to do in the past in the agencies that I've owned. It's something that I've kind of admired from afar. What are, what are y'all's thoughts on that? You can't mimic that. <laughs> I mean, that you either, you either have it or you don't. Um, it's, it is an admirable thing. And he did say that, a, not a lot, but people took it. People mm -hmm. took it and left. Now, having the courage to continue down that program when people literally took free money uh, is, is, is very impressive. Now, I, I wanna add to that story. Something that I wish I did, and for those, for those early on in their career and in, in insurance, I would take this advice and I would run with it. What Tony and the team did was that every single person started in customer service. The first two or three months, they absolutely had to be on the phones in customer service. It didn't matter if you were a CFO, if you were an admin, if you were sales, you start in customer service because customer service is the backbone of this company. I wish I did that. I can't wow. say I did. But I listened to that and I was like, okay, so if you spend let's say the two or three month thing in customer service. And then you're extended a two month offer, like you said, Jeff, to, to leave and take the cash. Well, that just goes to show you, well, you're, you are in our core competency of our business for the first two or three mm -hmm. months. If you want to take the two or three months salary and leave, go ahead. We don't want you anyways, you know, because you don't believe in what we do. Just, it's, it's a beautiful tie in. I, one of the things that I've been working on building at Quantum over the past year is our our onboarding training and curriculum for new producers, for agents when they come on board. And um, it's, a, it's a fantastic program. I'm really proud of it. Our, our education team did an awesome job, I think, hitting on so many fronts. But one of the things that I've been reflecting on as the year, you know, end of the year reflections, thinking about what can we do to make it even better? One of the things I think I missed was that I don't have our sales team shadowing the claims team and the customer service team anywhere early enough in the onboarding program. And I think that's one of the biggest changes that we're going to make going into first quarter of 2021 is giving them opportunities to at least shadow the claims team and have workshops with our claims advocate um, who has been in claims for 30 years and making sure that they're getting that like from the first week that we're not diving into um, 
the other distractions right away, but I think it'll help to really develop that, that heartbeat for what we really do when the rubber really meets the road a little bit better. So that's something that we're going to start working in. That's a great idea. I mean, I, I, I heard this podcast from um, insurance dudes and they were had, they had this agent named Dimitri from Broadway on the podcast. And then the guy says, I'm not telling you what option to pick. I'm going to put my insurance offer for you as if you're my mom and you're buying this property as my mom buying this property. So I'm going to give you the same coverage that I want my mom to choose. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. So, mm. you know, that's such a big thing that, sorry, we're sidetracking, but, you know, to, to experience that, to know that, you know, insurance is such a big thing that we sell changes people's life. There's no better way to understand that than from someone from the claim department, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's a genius idea, um, but where that fails, and I think taking a sidebar, like when you analyze uh, people like Tony and call him an influencer, call him an entrepreneur, call him whatever you want, when you, when you engage with these kind of people, you can't just pick tiny little things from each person you like and then mesh them into this one company because it does, it totally falls flat. Like Tony 1000% believed customer service was their core competency and it was their differentiating factor it was one of their three, right? And in your company, if you don't believe that, and that's okay, by the way, if you don't, but if you don't believe that customer service is, is one of your differentiating factors, this idea falls totally flat. Because people will shadow your customer service team and they'll be like, they don't like their jobs. Like, this isn't fun. Um, I want to go, I want to go back to sales. You know, like, that would be an epic fail. But, <laughs> it is really hard being a customer service agent in insurance. So shout out to all the CSRs listening. We're so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that Tony did that was different at the time was he, made the phone number to the customer service hotline front and center on their website, which was kind of against the like modern advice of the time, which was, you know, make sure everything's automated. Clients can help, help themselves check out on the website and be good to go. And, um, I believe he said that the telephone is one of the best branding devices out there. And, um, I would say that, you know, obviously video methods these days are also, you know, part of that, but a little bit harder to incorporate into our everyday interactions with clients at this stage. But um, it's, it's something that I've experienced as a Zappos customer purchasing shoes from their website. I love purchasing shoes from Zappos. It's so easy. And I've had returns before where it was really, really easy. The person helping me acted like they wanted to help me and they had solutions and they were kind of thinking ahead to, um, about what my needs were going to be. So it wasn't like pulling teeth and (laughs) super painful. Sometimes you go to a website and just getting through the chat bot is uh, you have to tell three different people why you're there and what your question about the return label is. And it's just not, it's just not like that at Zappos, you know, you can call and not have to, it's not going to be the most painful part of your day. So I think that that's something that definitely correlates to what our lives are like as insurance agents. And I I don't know what what you guys would add to that, but I have shadowed account managers before where I'm shadowing them and taking notes and, you know, like learning, watching, observing, and I'll see them answering emails and an email. Oh, one second. I have an email come in and they'll answer the email. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you, what are your thoughts about that? Because obviously the, the efficiency side of that comes in, but I think there's something a little bit deeper there too. Yeah, let me take a, I say sidebar too often, but let me take a, let me take a, a detour from that question and answer it in a different way. When people cancel their insurance plan from an agency, how do we make them feel? We typically make them feel like crap. Like we typically are like, you're going to this other provider. Geico is poor coverage. Progressive is not as good coverage. The agency down the street doesn't love you like we do. Da, 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 We, or we, we, you know, talk about like, we've been with you for so many years. How could you do X, Y, and Z? I think what you can take from what the story you just said is like, it's okay if we're not a, a fit for you right now. Like that's on us. That's not on you. And make the transition to the other agency or the other insurance provider smooth. 
because you have a chance at getting that customer back based on how you made them feel, not based on what you say. And I think that's kind of what I take from that story that you just said there. It's just, we at GNN have been guilty of that in the past. I know we have, and I wish I could take that back. They won't remember everything that we said, especially because we're an in insurance and a lot of it's just gonna go over their head, but they will remember how we made them feel. And I don't remember what was said in that, in that Zappos conversation or the exact reason why I had you know issues, but I remember that it was easy and it makes it really easy to shop with them again, um, for sure. So I think that sometimes in our businesses, our, our employees do a lot, they're responsible for a lot. And especially on the customer service team, um, one of the things to keep on our radar is that the phone ringing isn't a distraction. It's not a disturbance. It's not a, oh, something I have to handle when I'd rather be working up this renewal reshop or remarket over here. And so how do we, how do we change the culture in the agency to the phone ringing being a moment of happiness for our team member and not a distraction or disturbance? That's a question for Jeff. I can't answer that. That was too hard. Man, I take a, I take a next one on that. I'll come back to it. Well, so I'll, 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 I'll piggyback. Jeff and I will softball this back and forth until we find something. So the, 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 the direct question is if, how do we take the phone calls not as a distraction and, and as like, it's, it's, a, it's a right. Well, that starts from the beginning of valuing the consumer and understanding that without them, we really don't have a job. We have, we literally will sit on our hands and have nothing to do all day if these people do not call us. We have nothing to do. Now, would we prefer them to text or email? Yes, that is faster. We can respond in our own time. Would we prefer that they book on Calendly, like a call with us so we're exactly available and we have everything in front of us? Yes, but part of customer service is being available when they are available, not when we are available. That's easier said than done, but you know, I look at it that way. When I evaluate people's uh, importantness in my organization and what's their value to organization, what's their, um, you know, this important, this organization to me is my heart, my blood, my sweat, and is right here with my wife, with my kids, with my religion, you know, this company right here is up here, right? And when I try to evaluate like who's my foundation of the company, who's my pillars, who's my, who's my core, sometimes just can be so easy. You can just sit, sit back and watch who answers the phone first. Every organization, especially on the service side, right? There's always a group of people that never answer on the first ring. They all hear, they never answer. And they look around. You know, there's always a three to one ratio. Three, you know, the people who answer the most and then the one, the people who dodge, right? So I would say math, men lie, women lie, math don't lie, right? And then if you just look at on service side, the call volume and the call ratio, a lot of time you already can't distinguish who care about your company the way you do. Like for me, if uh, any time an organization from on service side when people need us, right? Service one day people need us. Sales is when people want us. So on the side that people need us, if they just looking around and say, I'm not that fun to go to three rings until, so I don't have the answer. If they're good with it, then you understand they just checking the clock, right? And they're the people that's gonna take that two month free money because your organization is not part of their long goal. And, you know, Tony always had that heartbeat check to make sure that the people in his organization is part of that heartbeat. Mm. I think I would challenge one tiny part of that. And that would be proposing that we put a step in between seeing who jumps to answer the phone on the first ring and then deciding what we're going to do with that information. I think the step we fit into there is not, you know, I don't want to assume that it's because they are checked out. I want to assume first that it's because they don't have the bandwidth. And I want to ask myself, like, what if I 
could do a couple things to increase their bandwidth so that I'm thinking about their mental, physical, and emotional energy and making it a little bit easier to be on all the time because we want them to be on when that phone rings. So, uh, so I think my initial thought is love the idea. Like, let's see who's jumping to answer the phone and celebrate that and, and be on it and observe and like know where our team is in that area, because that personal conversation with the client is so, so important. And then if it's not on point, what can we do about bandwidth to make it a little bit easier? One of the things that we do at quantum that helps with that, that I think would work in some agencies, even on a smaller scale is specialization of that role. I, I know a lot of our agents listening have already specialized sales and service. You've already segmented. So fantastic. That's so, so crucial, but you can also segment the customer service department so that the team working the fast service uh, routine requests is a different group of people than the ones that need time to do a remarket policy review in-depth consultation. And so it can help, um, it can help increase bandwidth. So it's just, you know, uh, something that's worked for us. That's uh, I just wanted yeah. to throw out there as well. You, I'll dive in there. You, like, go ahead, Jeff, go ahead. Have you guys been to uh, Zappos? No, no. You? Yeah, so. I haven't. I went there with Justin Egger, Troy Greenway, Tom Bianco, and you know, shout out to my boys. And we just decided to go there one day because we were we all read the book. We were all fan of Zappos model, right? And I remember it's one of the things that I made all my sales manager read because you know a lot of things in the book talking about how Tony had links exchange and he didn't enjoy coming to work because it became so corporate structured that, you know, if you want to talk to me, schedule a time with me through email and express your opinion on email. It took away, let's just talk, you know, let's just tell me what's on your heart, right? How would you treat someone that go to your church versus how you treat your employees are completely different. Microsoft came in there and boom, structure, structure, structure. And then Tony said, I, I stopped remembering the first name of the people who work for me, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, at Zappos, you know, Zappos was just literally like, I walked there, I was like, I feel like I have a 15-year-old son, right? And my 15-year-old son played video games. And if you guys have children, you know, imagine a bunch of kids playing video games together. <laughs> All the employees' desk at Zappos look like a big LAN party, local area network LAN party, right? And like, they decorate it however they want. This is not like, we are a billion dollar organization by Amazon. We got to make people look good. We got to bring it, you know, we got to wear white shirts. It was completely different. People literally just go to work to be happy. Mm. They dress how they wanted to dress when they come to work. And their desk is what makes them happy. Whether it's your fish, your dog, your family picture. Everything around the employee environment was what made them happy. And, you know, if you guys ever go to Vegas, strongly suggest take your entire team there because, you know, we got away from so much from it. And um, when we got the tour, there is a tour. You can book it on the same day. In the morning time, you call them and there's a guy that can book a tour for you. It's all free because they want you to come enjoy the Zappo experience. There's 10 amendments of what Zappo stand for when you walk in. I have that picture. I sent it to you, uh, Zach, in, um, some of the picture I took. And then also, you know, there's a lot of murals. Everywhere you go, there's just murals of famous people who are history achievers, who are big influencers, big visionary people. And then there's auditorium. Every single person, when they at Zappo, they finish their two weeks training or three weeks training I have to go back to the book to remember how long their training was. They go through a graduation ceremony. In the graduation ceremony, they get a Zappo swags, T-shirts, coffee mugs. I can't remember what else was on there, but it's a little box, right? It's always something new, something surprising called the Zappo swags. You just finished training. Welcome on board. We're graduating you. And, um, you know, they have people in the stand clapping. They bring their friends and family in. And um, it's so cool. It's one of the cool things I've seen. And I was just like, nobody build culture like this guy. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That's awesome. It's awesome. inspirational to, to see what's possible. Zach, when we were talking about segmenting, were you going to 
jump in and, and challenge some of those? Um, yeah, well, there, there's two things. Um, and I, I kind of got lost in Jeff's story. I love that story. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. I can't wait to see that picture. Um, but I think how you answer your doorbell defines a little bit of your character. Um, now, I'm not talking about a UPS guy or girl or FedEx or whatever. I'm talking about when you invite somebody over, you know they're coming. They're supposed to be coming at three o'clock in a non-COVID environment, and they come at three o'clock, right? There's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can be in a different room. You can, you know, walk, like Jeff, you said, they can ring the doorbell and you can kind of like wait a couple seconds and like pretend like you were busy or something and then go answer the door or whatever. Well, what my wife and I do on the regular is we actually open the door before somebody like is supposed to be there. And we kind of have like our dog, our son and our daughter, like super excited and like ready for these people to come over. So there's nothing better than pulling up. Like you're not even outside your car and a five and four year old are like, ah, like so excited to see you, right? And like, that's like, we're setting the stage for how you should feel about coming to our house. Wow. And to your point about the phone calls, I think that it all kind of comes back to how you want to set the table for how you engage with your business. And Zappos did a tremendous job from the get about how you want to engage with your business, but you have to decide. There are other people that I know that have like the perfect setup. So when you come to the house, like literally there's like a glass of champagne or like a coffee the way you like it. it none of it matters. It's just what, how the vibe you want to set. So when you were talking about the land party, that's the vibe that they want to set. They didn't do that by accident, right? That's exactly what nope. they want you to feel. It was just- cables everywhere. I, my <laughs> OCD was like, whoa. Because they just had cable hanging from every single area you can find. Like you look to your left, a bright cable. You look to your right, left, a bright cable. It was just, it was absolutely nuts. But at the same time, like so messy. I never stopped. I never stopped <laughs> seeing smiles. Like everybody was smiling. I was like, are they giving away caffeine or drugs here? But it was just like everybody was smiling, and they work at a call center. Mm. Yeah, and. Every agent has such a unique personality in our industry. We get to mold and shape the environment that's meaningful to us and, and bring people in that, that share those, those common values and, and goals. And so for every agency that might be different. And I, I like what Zach said about how, how you have to decide like what the feel is that you're trying to create because um, it doesn't have to be exactly like Zappos, for example, with the, you know, the, the, the messy wires or everything. Um, it could be something different for you because you're unique and what you bring is awesome in and of itself. I mean, when I think about when someone comes to our house at the Egger house, one of the things that, that we do intentionally, that's just because it's just us is we don't have TVs in the house. We don't have a TV downstairs or in the kitchen or in any of the bedrooms. We just, we do have a projector room up, upstairs that we rarely use that's just but that's just part of who we are go to someone else's house and they're gonna have sports up on the tv and they're gonna be having wings and beer that's also like a great environment and neither one is better it's just uh, about um being creative and who you are and create being intentional about just creating special special moments for people to interact whether it's at home or in your agency so we uh, call it we call it flying your freak flag (laughs) <laughs> like, in a, like that's that's kind of what it is right I mean there are there are houses around here that I walk in and Fox News is blaring I mean you can barely hear yourself think it's so loud and there are other houses like you said where they are very proud of the fact that they do x y and z and what have you it's just again your you know your vibe attracts your tribe and you know the Zappos they have that vibe. They're going to attract those kind of people. I do not think you're going to want to work at Zappos if you're OCD about how clean your desk is. Don't think it's the right I, time. I have another story to share. So one part is from the book, Delivering Happiness. And then the second part is what I saw in person. Um, sorry, my text message is like blazing in right now. Um, the first part of the book. Yeah. Post that you were, were you like, I'm live, guys. <laughs> when, when he was talking about Link Exchange and when he was building Link Exchange, before that, he built multiple companies. But one part about launching Link Exchange, and I'm not sure what process is pre launch or after launch, 
that he went out there and bought a whole floor of condos in San Francisco, probably before the housing boom, right? Of now, San Francisco, each condo is like $3 million, right? But he bought a whole floor of condos and he put every single person in his company in that floor. So literally you work all day with somebody and then by the time dinner come, you're going to have beer with that same person, literally walk outside your hall and then you're like in their room. You're still talking about work, right? He's getting, nobody get more out of their employees than Tony did because they were literally living, breathing, building projects and building visions and lifestyle. It didn't stop there. So that was from the book. And when I went to go visit Zappos, um, for those of you who have never been there, so Zappos is, they took over a downtown building, a government center. The entire Zappo building is a government center, right? And next to it, he took over two empty lots that used to be like whatever parking garage. And he built uh, apartment complexes, like 13, 14 story apartment complexes there. If you work for Zappos, you can get rent there for hmm. 400 or 500 bucks or something like that. So one is a great monopoly play on real estate that you get to acquire a piece of asset and somebody is already preoccupied that asset. So you know you're appreciating on, on the asset. But the most importantly, it go back to that synergy. Like these people work all day to each, with each other. They're gonna go grocery shop together, dinner together, play together, basketball together, gym together. I mean, you talking about building a company that so far away from work and life separation, like the definition of work and life integration was mm. when I saw those apartments, I was like, wow, they really on sync with each other every single day. What stands out to me is the risk that went into creating that kind of culture. And I think as insurance agents, sometimes we're not super risk tolerant. You know, it depends which way you look at it. Depends what kind of entrepreneur you are, but we're certainly uh, familiar with risk. And I, I don't think that doing something ground shaking and, and world changing and as big as what Tony Shay's legacy has become comes without risk. He, he made some big decisions that weren't just about what he was passionate about with happiness and caring about people, but he, he took some huge risks when we're talking about the offer, paying someone to leave the company, creating a lifestyle center for employees. Those are things that make a business owner kind of like squirm a little bit like, oh, I can think of all the things that could go wrong. And I think there's definitely a place for that. Um, and so I'm not suggesting that we all go out and mimic what Tony did, but it's certainly a big part of what I admire about him and why I think his legacy is so special because what he achieved was so different than what would be easy to, to mimic in everyday life. You can't mimic it. You're right. I mean, because what you care about, what I care about, what Jeff cares about is slightly different. It just, it is, but you can admire and you can take and bring it back. And I think we have core values. Okay. And I'll, I'll give a direct example of something we struggled with. So we have core values that we live by. There are three that our team came up with. We did it the, what we think is the right way. It's pretty similar to how Tony did it. Um, and we live by them. We hired by them. We fired by them. And when we sold um, our company to the, the parent company now, um, I didn't agree with their core values. I don't think they aligned. And um, we made the active decision not to carry their core values over to our company. We said, we're gonna run it completely independently and we are gonna live by our core values and continue down that path of our core values. And I'm proud that we did that. And you know, we're a year later now looking back at it saying, Oof, that was a good decision because their core values are just different. Um, and I would argue that you probably shouldn't work at GNN if you want their core values, you probably work somewhere else. Um, the first time I heard that story, I was inspired. And then I was like, okay, connect on LinkedIn, connect on Facebook. I was like, these guys are awesome. I'm connecting with them. Mm -hmm. And um, I love the whole core value thing. You know, this is what we build. This is what we're proud about. And let us continue to build the thing that we are proud about to build that legacy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, Tony was such a visionary in everything he did. Like the whole buying a whole suite of condos so you and all your employees live together and by building an apartment downtown next to your campus 
visionary. Like, you know, there's a saying called fortune favors the brave and tomorrow's not for the fan of heart. So, you know, Tony build that. Well, he, well, he believed in collisions, right? That's what he talked about. He believed in, yes. in people and people colliding with other people and the conversations that they would have and what would come from those conversations. Now, if you believe, again, I keep going back to the same thing, but if you believe in work-life balance, by definition, you're trying not to collide with other people. So he is in essence saying, no, we're all going to be right here. And what did he do? I, Jeff, I think, um, he made like one entrance and one exit into, which I think is a, a major um, fire hazard, but regardless, like he literally, <laughs> he literally made it. So you had to go in and out this exact same way. You couldn't yep. exit anywhere else. One cafeteria, if you want to eat, you got to see the people you don't want to see. It's beautiful. It, it, but again, you know, to your point, Caitlin, about trying to mimic, that's why it's so impossible to mimic someone like this. It's, it, you can admire, you can take from, but to mimic it, the whole strategy works together. It's almost like he built this entire spider web. Um, and, but in the beginning is happiness, like you said, like what creates happiness? Well, his vision was all of these things do. One of the things that I think was so startling about losing Tony was because he was so young and, you know, none of us are guaranteed our, our time here on earth. So I, I, I just want to ask you guys to just share with the listeners, um, when it comes to those core values, could you share with us maybe one or two things that you're working on building to be a part of your legacy, things that are important to you when it comes down to it and what, what you would want people to think of when they think of Zach Gold or Jeff She, what, what does it really come down to? And um, that's it. I'm sorry to throw all the hardball questions at you guys. It's a hard one. I know. Um, But you guys are influential leaders that I really want to get inside uh, what, what makes you tick and, and these things that you guys, I know, spend a lot of time on and. Yeah. So legacy is a, is a super interesting topic. Um, you know, how do you want to be remembered? I mean, you know, I think about Lou Holtz when I think about this kind of, uh, discussion, because he talked about, there is a big dis- distinction between successful and significant. And he defined it as when you're successful, when you die, it's over when you're, but significant people make other people successful and therefore they live on. Now, my legacy that I want to lead is I just want to be known as a guy who cared. I, I tell people on their first day, you can ask anybody at GNN, I say the same thing in 10 years from now, I do not care if you're working at GNN. I hope you are, but that's your decision. And that's our decision together. You do not have a lifetime contract here. But what I do hope is in 10 years from now, if I see you, we can grab a beer because we're on those kind of terms. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to live by is I want to do the right thing. If somebody finds a better offer for themselves, they better take it. If it is, if it aligns with what they want to do, they better go with it. So I guess my long story short, like my legacy is nothing to do with GNN. I've actually kind of segmented from that. My legacy more is about who I am at home matches who I am at work. That's great. That's a great answer. <sighs> Kaylin, you did not give me time to warm up to this question. <laughs> so I guess I'll try to take it from here. Um, you know, I came from like one of those tiger mom, tiger dad, Asian family and in the Asian household, um, my cousin, my oldest cousin was strategist for Microsoft. He advised Bill Gates, um, the direction of Microsoft and he graduated from Harvard, had perfect SATs. I had two other cousins, partner, in McKenzie Group, partner in Price Waterhouse Cooper, and they all had like 1,500 plus credit scores. I mean, not credit score, SAT scores, and went to Princeton, went to Yale, just super accomplished. And you know, in the Asian culture, there's a lot of stigma about if you're not achieving at a high academic level, you never make something out of life. And I remember I made the decision to not go to college, and my mom literally almost unfriended me in real life. And she said that if you're not going to go to college, you got to go join military where you will never be F in life. And it was hard, you know, being 18 years old to take that from my mom. And I think one of the legacy I want to leave behind is to show people, you know, school doesn't define you. You know, your job doesn't define you. College doesn't define you. Being a good person and leave memory 
for other people and being loved, that's what define you and happiness define you. Like, you know, I, I am in a group chat with three of my close friends and then I just hear them every day about how to give their kids an edge. Like I want to give this tip, this tutor, this private school, so my kid can go to this college, so they can go to Ivy school, blah, 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 blah. It's all about edge. And then I just listen in, right? Because, you know, nobody want to be told they're wrong on Facebook. But it wasn't until 15 years later, my mom came to me and then we're trying to like hatch up our relationship and put together what was broken. My mom said to me, you know, your oldest cousin, you know, he's so successful. He's super successful. He is in one of the biggest seat in the world of the biggest company that changed the world. But I see him get up at 4.30 in the morning. He have two child and a wife. He come home at 10.30 and he still finishes his email at 11 o'clock. And I don't wish that on you. You know, he's super successful, but I barely see him smile every time I see him because he's trying to change Microsoft. But, you know, what about your family? And then my mom said to me, she was like, one thing I fail as a mom is I didn't ask you what, what make you smile, what make you happy. So if I could walk away with a legacy and, you know, I just go back to my childhood and, you know, I want to say, hey, you know what, there's a lot of things that you could achieve. And I believe through sales, I found my niche, right? Through sales, I found my niche that college did not say I'm good at something. So through sales, I found my niche. And after I find my niche, I learned leadership skill set and being visionary. And, you know, now we're on an opportunity to give a lot of agents hope, right? A lot of captive agents who are leaving the captive world, they walk into that position. They're like, this is hope. This is life. This is my next 30 years. And when they realize captive agent is not hope, it's not the next 30 years, you know, selfishly, I'm pitching quantum, but we want to give these agent hope that, hey, you know what? You don't need to depend on these 30, 40 billion dollar corporation to have hope. We're giving you hope. And you don't need a college degree to have hope because your success in life doesn't build on that college degree, that piece of paper. So if I you know, answer your short question, you know, long answer, if my legacy is, is giving people hope that their future is not defined by one thing. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, hey. I love that, guys. Tossing in one, one more thing, um, th there are two things, actually I'm tossed two, there are two things that I think we didn't get a chance to talk too much about that I'd just like to bring up quickly about, about that in Tony's legacy that I think we can learn from. Um, one is how he treated vendors. I think that um, in the, as insurance agents, we do an awful, awful job with our vendor relationships. When I say vendor, I mean our insurance partners. I mean, you know, whoever you necessarily use. I think we beat up underwriters. I think we beat up marketing reps. I think that we don't do a good job really treating our vendors. And Zappos, there's so many studies out there. You can read all of them. They do such a fantastic job at making their vendors part of their strategic partners. And it benefited them over and over and over and over. I think that's beautiful. And the last thing I think that we didn't get the chance to talk about that I really liked that him and Jeff Bezos share is that they didn't obsess over their competitors. They really didn't. They acknowledged them. They knew kind of what they were doing, but they focused all of their energy on their customers and their vendor partners and their employees. And if we can do that as insurance agents, if we can focus our energy on that and not focus our energy on our competitors, it's be a much, much more beautiful place to work. Makes a world of yeah, difference. You hit that on the dot. You hit that on the dot. Like it's so tough being a vendor these days. I mean, can you imagine being like account rep for one of these lead companies, being an account rep for a tech solution, being an account rep for like, you know, insurance carriers. Insurance carriers these days are cost cutting to catch FICO, cost cutting to catch progressive. So they're feeling for their job every single day on top of that make sure your agents produce this loss ratio, this type of results, is it really something they can control, right? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, 30 million acres of West Coast that's burning, right? Let's not, now things they can control. So our reps, our vendors get beat up and then we 
we never really take the time to say thank you. And I think you just inspire me. I'm going to go make some videos after this and send them out. We should, right? I mean, because ultimately, if we don't, they are going to be in a race to the bottom. And if they're in a race to the bottom, that means they might win. And that means that, that they have to cut our expenses, like our funding, like the, none of it works. We have to build strategic partnerships with our vendors. And when I was looking through my notes in this book, that's one of the things that I circled a bunch of times. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, like that, that got lost in the way of building GNN. I know I've had difficult conversations with our vendor partners that I regret. Like I remember. Um, and I would say I will challenge you, Jeff, and I'll challenge me and, and you, Caitlin, like in 2021 as like an ode to Tony, there's a lot of things we could do, but maybe let's just be better, better partners with our partners. I think that would be yeah. a better world. Amen. I love yeah. it. I'm thinking of people I can reach out to on LinkedIn. You know, you get the, the messages on LinkedIn from someone who's in biz dev and they're reaching out and like, we've all been there and had had positions like that and I think that even if we don't need their product right now there's a huge opportunity there to like send an awesome friendly message back and like hey I see you're doing great things and I'm glad we're connected and Jeff I love your idea of sending the video text something that Jeff does that just it brightens my day every time um Jeff doesn't just send a text or an email Uh, when he wants to just like say something or send like a heartfelt message he sends a short video via text and he's like hey and like what we we uh work really hard at quantum i remember one day we were having just like a a tough day just a challenging day and he sent me a video text he's like hey caitlin i really appreciate all the great job you're doing with quantum university love working with you have hope you have a great day and it would have been great to have as a text but getting that as a video text mm. it's it, it's huge it makes a, a world of difference so thanks for that jeff i appreciate the the encouragement but um really great takeaways you guys i feel like we walked away with just so much inspiration of things that that we can take with us into 2021 and that that challenge to interact differently and be better with whatever vendor it is that we're working with our carrier partnerships or business partnerships, I think is, is huge. And will make a really big difference in how people think of us. Um, imagine Jeff, we inspire, mm-hmm. imagine we inspire the people in our circle, GN leadership, quantum leadership. And we get like, I don't know, five, 10 other CEOs, entrepreneurs that we admire. Let's go to Vegas, go to Vegas for a couple of <laughs> days. Have some good food, not as good as Boston, Boston? No. but you know Vegas, Vegas. You know we got bring down Vegas level, and then we just go visit Zappos. You know it just it just be cool. Like my experience, what I took away from it was so much. Like, and um, I'm you know, down. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. You 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 had me at let's go. Um, <laughs> I didn't even listen to the rest, but I would say that like what we should we can do- spend a couple of days together comparing our own trading notes and teach each other to it. be better. I love it. So let's do this. Like a year from now, let's let's all be better with our vendor relationships and let's meet in Vegas to one, obviously do all what you just said, but two, kind of review how life's different since we treated our vendor relationships this way. Like it's good. We're going to be in such a better place and we're going to achieve so much and probably inspire a lot of other companies to to pass it on, man. It's going to be great. Yeah, I love it. I love that. Guys, I took so many notes and I'm just so inspired by what you guys have done that you're building and just for being open about challenges that you've had and things that you're still working out. But I I love that we can come together as an agency community and learn from each other and and have these these opportunities to, to think and talk and be able to work through some of these, these big ideas. And I'm really grateful for Tony Shea's legacy. And um, he must have worked really hard for a really long time to build such an amazing organization. So I, I really admire that and um, really look forward to us hopefully being able to take a, a tour of, of Zappos one day for those of us that haven't been. So um, yeah, I'm get, personally, after this episode, I'm going to be thinking about how we answer the doorbell. And (laughs) I think there's so much to be said there. And thinking about like, what is our core competency and making sure that, that we always keep that close to the heart and that that's going to be something that doesn't get outsourced or, or too automated. So thank you so much, Zach and Jeff, um, for your insights and for, for joining us today for, um, this episode. 
Agents, thank you for listening to the Age of Independence. This is Caitlin, Zach, and Jeff signing off until next time. Talk to you soon.